for some really good fellowship, too. Uh, they say life, well, I turned 50, my wife and I, this summer, so uh, it feels like uh, when I first was uh, into the ministerial, I very much felt like the young person on the team, and now they've uh, very much pointed out that you're the oldest now. <laughs> I don't know if I'm the oldest uh, by age, but I know that we've been there for a while, so if it's, uh, I remember Kenja was just a, a little, uh, very, very, well, she was walking barely when we started, so I don't know, we were talking the other day about how many years it's been, that's a... Uh, it's getting to be a big number, but it's also been a fun number, and uh, so much has changed, and so much has happened, and I'm sure it's the same for you. Um, they say that life is like a roll of toilet paper. The closer you get to the end, the faster it goes. <laughs> and, uh, maybe that's the way it is with life. It does seem to go faster as it goes. Um, it's amazing. And uh, yet, uh, I think all of us can say along the way that, that God is good. I got an old joke though. I think when they asked me to be MC, they expected a few jokes. And John Newfell just said, too, we better have a couple. So, uh, this is coming from a mom. My nine year old daughter walked in while I was getting ready for work. What are you doing? She asked. Putting on my wrinkle cream, I answered. Oh, she said, walking away. I thought those came naturally. <laughs> For her 40th birthday, my wife said, this is somebody else, <clears throat> I'd love to be 10 again. So that Saturday, we had a heaping stack of chocolate chip pancakes, her favorite childhood breakfast, then we hit the playground with the mayor and Mary around. We finished the day with the banana split. So, how did you enjoy being a kid for a day, I asked her at the end of the day. Great, she said. But when I said I wanted to be 10 again, I was talking about my dress size. <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes that happens too. Um, <laughs> how many of you uh, remember coming to the old school, the old family nights that we used to have here Sunday nights? How many remember of you coming to those? I think that's a vast majority. So yeah, I remember too. And I look forward to those. And uh, you know, it's a good time to reminisce too. And I remember, uh, usually there'd be open items. There's open items later on, so you can start thinking about that. But I do remember also that uh, usually Henry Wolf would go up and he would share something. And I know him as a man that uh, had uh, lots of good things in life happen, but then also some tough things that would happen. And he would share about that. And as a young person back then, I appreciated the wisdom that he'd be able to share with the family nights. And I'm expecting to hear some good reminiscing and hear some good uh, insight and uh, things shared this evening as well. So be thinking about that for later. I always uh, counted uh, open items as a highlight uh, for myself. We do have a good meal planned, and uh, thank everybody who brought something today. And uh, look forward to that. Uh, let's pray before we take part in that. Thank you, Father God, for provision for our needs. Really, you treat us so much better than we deserve. And for that, we give you thanks. We thank you for this church and how it's been uh, a great opportunity to, to use our gifts, to be equipped, and to equip other people as well, and to share fellowship. We pray that you bless our fellowship and our time together tonight. Thank you for all the good years that you've blessed this church with. And uh, I pray that uh, many years would come where we would continue to humble ourselves, to pray, and that you would continue to heal us and to bring us closer to our relationship with yourself. Thank you, too, for the food that we're about to partake. And we thank you for the drink and the food and uh, for those who have provided it as well. And we thank you for your goodness to us in Jesus' name. Amen. We've got a weird way of going first. You might need a calculator, but uh, I'm not sure if some of the ladies, if you don't want to share your age, to, but uh, add up the, around the table, add up all the years you have, whoever's got the most years, you're going to get to go first. <laughs> See some calculators here. Should have never had the youth pastor sit at your table, sorry. <laughs> We're going to get to be auction say, auctioneer here pretty soon. What's that? Everybody's got their number? Who will give me 500? Who will give me 500? 500? Who will give me 400? 400? 400? Cheap, cheap, cheap. 400? 400? 400? Over 400? 
Six hundred. Who'll give me six? Anybody else give me six? Now we're in. Who'll give me six hundred? Six hundred. It's old. You're up for lunch. Um, the coffee on the left side there is uh, decaf. The stuff on the right side is uh, the regular stuff. So uh, anybody that was in the 600, your table is good to go. Anybody that was 500, you're good to go as well. So uh, your both tables will go first. <laughs>
the evening. I can just remember when I would, when we started here, I would have been shaking to go up here and say something. <laughs> but uh, it, it sort of wore off a bit. <laughs> I have chosen a scripture passage from Philippians 3, verse 8 to 15. And you know, as believers in Christ, we are in the process of sanctification. Let's take note of the goals the Apostle Paul set for himself in the passage that I'm going to read. And some believe what Paul wrote to the Philippians was about 30 years after his salvation experience on the Damascus Road. So that's 30 years he had been ministering and preaching and all these things. And this is what he writes. And there are still some goals that he's aiming for, hoping that he'll accomplish that. So we're going to start reading in verse 8 of chapter 3 of the Philippians. Yea, the doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, through whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and to count them but done, that I may win Christ. And he found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his faith. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained either were already perfect, but I follow after, if that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. <coughs> I come not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God and Christ Jesus. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this occasion. Yes, it brings back many memories. But yes, there are still goals that we want to reach. And I think while you are here, we want to serve you. We want to reach out to those who are hurting. We want to come alongside, alongside those who need comfort. Oh Lord, we pray that our lights may shine. And we thank you how you've kept us through all those years. And you've guided and directed us. Yes, there were problems and there were also growing pains. But still, you led us, you guided us. And sometimes, there were times when we were not sure where to go. We had to come and pray and find you again to show us the way. We thank you, Jesus. Name. Amen. Thank you, Mr. Gunther. I was doing some reading on the life cycles of the church as it's our 45th anniversary. And uh, they say that often we follow what usually happens. Uh, right around this age of the church, they start having problems. And that's a good warning for us, but I don't think it has to be that way. I think what it uh, is going to depend on is uh, having a, a vision to reach not just inside the church, but outside the church. And they say that churches that have a vision in mind that is outward and uh, wanting to help others being that uh, hands and feet for Jesus, that never gets old, that never goes out of style. And uh, trust that uh, that will be where we go. We don't have to follow what other churches necessarily, the trends. And uh, they do say that some of the toxicity that comes from is uh, sometimes, you know, well, we never did it, used to do it that way. Or, well, that's not the way we always done in the past. 
we've done a lot of changing here at, East, at uh, I was going to say ECA at OMC. And uh, a lot of that is good, and uh, some of it you always going to wonder, but uh, we are moving forward. And uh, yet some of the, some of the, some things, like I said before, Pastor Gunther shared, some things don't change. Jesus Christ doesn't change. His word doesn't change. And uh, growing together and having a relationship with Christ, that is, that's got to be first and foremost, that doesn't change. So some of those things that for, from the past are very good, we want to stick with those things. And some of the things that are coming that are new, we want to evaluate those things and uh, make sure that they are pointing us towards Christ and that our vision is not just for ourselves, but our vision is also that others would know Him and uh, that uh, will keep us from following the trends that uh, seem to follow churches. John Unger is going to have us uh, do some singing. Ask him forward.
393, take my life and let it be. Number 393. Undeterred, they pressed on, continuing to obey, 
the word of the Savior to teach the good news and to baptize believers in the names of the three, the Father all-glorious, the great risen Son, and the Spirit, our counselor, our teacher, and friend. They lived and they died, were beaten and cried. They were chased from their homes and went without bread. Their leaders were taken by blade and by flame, and still they obeyed the Savior's command. The boy interrupted, his coffee forgotten. So how did they walk on? How did they stay true? What gave them courage to endure such great loss? From the lips of the first there came this reply, not by strength nor by sword, but by his word and by prayer, through the work of the Spirit, our helper and friend. And from the mouth of the second there followed these words, there came a sad day when the leaders were few, so God raised up a man, Menno Simons, the priest he lived and he taught, and he worked and he toiled. He gave guidance to those who were lost and confused. He wandered around with no safe place to stay, for the princes of Europe saw him as a threat. By the word and by prayer through the spirit of might, he preached the good news till the Lord called him home, and as the years wore on, the hatred remained. Anabaptist blood continued to flow, their flesh all devoured by ravenous flames. So, to survive, they banded together. They farmed on the land and built up their homes. Out of fear for their lives, they fled from the world. They moved into Russia and built up their towns. They founded colonies. And sadly, out of their lives, out of their love for their lives and traditions so dear, they stopped spreading the gospel of our death-killing king. But why did they stop? Did they not know that their neighbors were dying and going to hell, never hearing the news of our death-killing king who gave us the spirit to make us alive? From the lips of the second there came this reply. Sadly, their faith gave way into fear. They stopped bearing the cross, for they held their lives dear. They stopped living by prayer as they had in the past. They stopped up their ears to the word of the Lord. And so they forgot the love of the Son and the love of the Father who gave him for us. They loved their traditions, their old way of life, their language and customs became their new Lord. The sun rose and set, and days turned into years, and change was demanded in the land of the Tsar. So to escape they fled to the west, across the Atlantic, to the, to the world that was new. In the plains of Canada, they built churches and farms. First in Manitoba and then in Saskatchewan, the old colony Mennonites is what some were called. With their high German scriptures, their jokes and their borscht. The sermons were scripted and passed down through the years, from preacher to preacher, nearly always the same. They were taught they must work if they wanted to go to dwell with the Father and be saved from his wrath, and told to stay separate keeping things as they were, to be modern was evil, the old, thing, the old ways were sure. The high German scriptures were hard to discern, like looking through glasses that were foggy and scratched. We could not understand them and did not know the truth. The waitress then came and poured a fresh cup for each of the men who had sat down to talk, to recount the account of their church down the street. The coffee it steamed and the young man took a sip. So how did things change, and how did it happen? Please tell me the story of our church down the street. From the lips of the first there came this reply, not by strength nor by sword, but by his word and by prayer, through the work of the Spirit, our helper and friend. And from the mouth of the second there followed these words, we started to hunger, we longed for the truth. From the word of Father, the great risen Son, and the Holy Spirit, all, abund all holy, abundant in grace. We yearn for the knowledge of our death-conquering King, for that sense of His presence and for the family of God. So, in the summer of 72, we started to meet. It was John Weed, his wife Mary, and my dear wife Marge, and my name is Henry, in case you forgot. We prayed and we studied, sang praise and discussed, while our children would play and often would listen with smiles on their faces and joy in their hearts. Soon others joined us in prayer and in praise. The fellowship was sweet as we studied the word. There was Dave Fair and Sarah. 
Andy Fair and two Johns, and in those days, their pastor, Jake Beebe, started to bring a Bible to church to read straight from the Word instead of the old script passed down through the years. And so the bishop got mad for tradition Jake broke. He told the pastor he must no longer preach. They would find someone else who would keep things the same. On November 2nd of 74, a small group, they gathered the same as before. They prayed and they studied. They sang and discussed. And there, Jake Weed told them that he'd been let go. It was a Saturday night with communion on Sunday, and Reverend Weed was reluctant to go. So after discussing the group, they decided to gather at the home of Jake Weed in the morning. They went home that night with emotions all mixed, but happy in Jesus and trusting his word. That Sunday, they gathered 13 families represented, 33 men and women with their boys and their girls. Reverend Weed taught the word and we sang. How precious to us were the words of that hymn. We have an anchor that keeps the soul steadfast and sure while the billows roll. Fastened to the rock, which cannot move, grounded firm and deep in the Savior's love. And so by the word and by prayer, through the grace of the Lord, eleven men and their families left the old colony church. We rented a building from the town of Osner, and on November 17th, we first worshipped there. For one hundred a month, we could use it to meet, to pray and be taught, to praise and to gather. For thus says the Lord, who created the earth, who formed it and made it, Yahweh is his name. Call to me, yes call, I will not ignore. I will tell you great things that you have not known. So spoke Jeremiah, the prophet of God, in the 33rd chapter of the scroll that he wrote. These words from our God were precious to us, for we knew God would speak and teach us the truth. We would show, he would show us great things that we had not known through the Spirit, our teacher, who inspired word. How happy were we that at last we were free to teach our children from God's holy book. And what happened next? This cannot be the end. How did it grow from 12 families to roughly 500 people in 2016? From the lips of the first there came this reply, not by strength nor by sword, but by his word and by prayer, through the work of the Spirit, our helper and friend. And from the mouth of the second, there followed these words. Our little church grew and grew yet some more. We outgrew the building and needed to move. The Reverend J. Pauls gave an acre of land. The new building was started in 75. On March 28th of the following year, we gathered together to worship God there. Sunday school had, was begun that same year to teach to the children the word of the Lord. Oh, thank God for the teachers, too many to count, who all through the years have taught us the word. Thank God for Pete Gunther and others besides, who labored in love and helped us to grow, and for women like Betty, who led BBS, and introduced young ones to Jesus who died. God brought still more people multiplying our joy, but we needed more leaders to help share the load. So he raised up for us deacons and ministers too. Corny Gunther, then Bill Jansen, and Simon and John, then Ron Dirksen, Bern Weeb, and now Gary and Dan. But how did the people know which men they should choose? And how is it those leaders can lead like they do? Then John Weeb, <clears throat> he smiled and drank from his cup, and answered the lad the same as before, not by strength nor by sword, but by his word and by prayer, through the work of the Spirit, our helper and friend. Then Henry continued to recount the account of Ulster Mission Chapel, the church down the street. In 77, the young started to go to schools of the Bible to study the word. Young Henry Weep was one of the first soon followed by others who were eager to learn. While at school, God opened their eyes to his harvest fields, white with laborers few. Missionaries were invited, and they came and they shared both the work of, spirit, 
of spirit in the hearts of the lost. Dave Wheat was one man God powerfully used to stir in young hearts and fill them with care for the souls that were dying and going to hell, never hearing the news of our death-conquering King who gave us the spirit to make us alive. <coughs> So one of them stepped up to the plate. He answered the call to go and proclaim. His name was Ken Yunther, and he was the first, soon followed by others, like Teresa and Val. These young men and women, they picked up the cross and said, Here am I, I'll go to the lost, to tell of your love and the blood that you shed, to make sinners your children, give life to the dead. By the word and by prayer, they went out from our midst. And we stood behind them, we prayed and we gave, laying up treasures in heaven, our home, where one day we'll worship with the souls that Christ saved by the work of his spirit through those that he sent. In the 1980s, revival broke out by the word and by prayer through the spirit of God. Many youths, they repented, surrendered their lives, got rid of possessions that were sinful and wrong. They wanted them gone, so a fire was lit to devour those things that had displeased the Lord. And then in the 90s, God moved in my heart to study the Bible with friends in my home. It displeased the leaders who feared error and division, but God undertook and conflict died down. Soon people, soon people who feared to enter a church came into my home to study the word. By the word and by prayer, not power or steel, hearts were transformed and God's kingdom grew. And now as we speak, there are 13 such studies where people can gather to read and to pray and be taught by the Spirit from God's Holy Word. Conflicts have arisen. There's been trials and strife about whether to baptize by immersion or pouring and what translation to read from in the church Sunday morning. Some left the church Harsh words have been said, discussions have lasted for hours on end, but by the word and by prayer through the Spirit of God, the strife has not sunk us or caused us to fail. From Zurich to Ulster, these 500 years, our God has not faltered, His Spirit not changed. His power, His boundless, His love knows no end. He still answers prayer and speaks through His word, and, through, and though mountains may tremble, and trials should come, he'll always, forever be our King and our dear friend. Well read and well said, that deserves a hand. <laughs> that Andrew Wright has a lot of insight. When I first came on the ministerial, I was a young buckaroo, and uh, I remember a certain uh, Jake Fair, he wasn't too sure about this young whipper snapper. <laughs> and, uh, but since then, we've become really good friends. And, uh, and uh, I could just tell in Jake Fair that he had a love and a concern for what happens at the ministerial and what happens at OMC. It, 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 it better be right. <clears throat> it better be good. And uh, he's going to bring us all to us. Things of the past. 
I'm not going to mention any more. There are a lot more changes that I see, but uh, there's more important things. And uh, I will, uh, today, I want to share what is really important to God, which has already been mentioned. And uh, I will entitle my object lesson, God's Ultimate Design. And I think we, we all know what that is. this wire was intended to do. 
I assume it was uh, for some good reason, but I don't know what. Then I, I have a light here. And this light, right now, I, I use it for testing to see if this wire was still in good condition. And if I connect it to it, the light will go on. So it, it does work. Maybe I should show you. Maybe you don't believe me. Like 
is God. It says in 1 John 1 verse 5, God is light and in him is no darkness at all. And when we connect God to our talents, it'll flow through and others will see the light of God shining through us. When we look at the insulator and we see the wood, how firmly it is attached to the insulator. It's, it's tight in there, you cannot move it. And to me, it tells me about the desire that God has for intimacy with each and every one of us as believers. In Mark chapter 12, verse 30, it says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. If that happens, there is intimacy. Also, Matthew 23, verse 37, <coughs> this is where Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings. God desires true intimacy with us as believers. And that's what I, I see when I see these insulators and how the tree the, the, has just uh, built itself right around so closely that there's no movement. Like Jesus said, I am the vine, you're the branches, if you abide in me, and I abide in you. See, and this is what abiding is. If this insulator had decided one day <coughs> before it was all in there to move, every day move a little further, it would have never established this intimacy. This one here, it used to be that you couldn't see anything of it except the back part of it, but because of the humidity in this country, it's so dry, it broke apart. But I thought, of, thought to myself, you know, this could be a strained relationship. That's what it looks like. It's, a, it's not as intimate as it should be. In conclusion, <clears throat> I'll read this verse, Colossians 3, 15 to 17. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing songs, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, the Father, through Him. That's intimate living. When I look back uh, over the history of our church, yes, there have been a lot of changes, but I am uh, thankful for our ministerial pastors as they have been preaching messages they have always preached the message of salvation and uh, growth in Jesus Christ which I am very thankful for and I, I trust that the Lord will give strength and wisdom to future pastors to continue that ministry thank you very much Jake, we have Pastor Gary, who's going to give it emotional. I won't tell any puns about Jake's. You're going to say something about the leader, aren't you? <laughs> no, I'm just going to leave it alone. <laughs>
I will not give any comment. I would not do that. Well, it is uh, a privilege uh, to be here. I'm not going to give so much an emotional as I am going to, well, whatever it is, it is. Mrs. Weep, uh, man, what a, we're, we counted, I counted a privilege to have you here and to be able to share again. Yeah, you know, we're celebrating it happened in November, but 45 years of uh, what was so, so much on your heart of your husband and, and uh, together you shared that vision and that passion with others. That's, that's what brings us here today to celebrate 45 years of, and, and so, like, I feel like, for many of you, I was that young punk kid. Uh, I was five years old when this church started. I was five or six when my family started coming here. And, uh, you know, you saw me and Mr. Weed one, one day. I remember I had a hymnal, and, and I should have brought a elastic band. I remember... Reverend Weed, one Sunday, I was sitting in the front row, very front row, I had a elastic band. Sorry? Rubber band? Yes. There's one in that bag. There's one in that bag? Because <laughs> I can, yeah, oh, awesome. Oh, this is perfect. Because I can ex illustrate exactly what I did and, and my musical talent that one Sunday morning, and that was my scary day with Pastor Jake Weed. I don't know who was leading singing that Sunday morning, but man, was I keeping tune with that song as I was as I was flicking away in, in my songbook. And after the service, Reverend Jake Weed came and he just gently told me, and he did it graciously and gently, and just let me know that that was pretty noisy what I was doing there. And but he did you know he did it in such a gracious way. So there's so many so there's this young punk kid that this little whipper snipper kid that you guys all saw growing up and, and now I'm here before you and so it, it, I feel unworthy to be here um, in, in a sense. And um, but here is what your your vision, what you what you guys met together, when you met together, this is your vision and, and, and your desire to serve God, to teach people about Jesus. This is what happens. This is the result of this, this young, snot-nosed kid who made you know, loud, obnoxious noises during church. Many of you taught me Sunday school and, and spoke into my life for, uh, you know, um, uh, with, with, we called it young people back then, right? And uh, you spoke in my life, but that's what happens. And so, there to you know, you invested heavily. And so, this is this is saying thank you for everything that you have done. And so, founders, pastors, and elders, and deacons, and and very special guests. Today we celebrate 45 years of the life of Ozer Mission Chapel. Over the past couple of years, and probably since I became the, the lead pastor here, I have asked the question, how did we get here? Now, how did we get here? Yeah, I realized that, yeah, I got here, you know, my mom conceived. I, I get that, you know, that's how I got here. Or even tonight, you know, I got here in a car. So, but how did we, as a church, get to this very day, 45 years from where we were? How was OMC birthed? And what brought us to this day? How did this little group of, of 11 or uh, 13 families grow to over 500? How did that happen? Maybe some of us older people, and, and, and I think I've been there, but I think now my now as, as I'm growing older and, and starting to understand things a little bit differently, why should we care? about why we got here, or how we got here. A lot of times we're talking about, let's move forward, not let's not move, look back. I mean, there should be, why are we looking back? But there's a very clear reason for remembering. And here's why. 
The vision was extremely clear. You had a very clear vision and purpose was real. And so don't hesitate to appreciate the core principles of the visions and strengths that founded this church. Yeah, and we've talked about them. There's a lot of things that have changed along the 45-year journey. You probably wouldn't have your lead pastor here with a colored shirt, without a tie, with it tucked in 45 years ago. That's changed. And I don't do that to disrespect anything, anyone or anybody. I'll, I'll tell you this secret, because you, the founders of this church, need to know this, why I do not wear a tie most Sundays or a jacket. It is simply a heating issue. My core temperature is, is extremely high, and, and, and really, I love wearing a tie, I love wearing a jacket, but I do it simply for the fact of trying to stay cooler and, and not having a pool of water around me by the end of my preaching. So I do not do it out of disrespect. Please know that. But that's one of the things that have changed. Lots of things have changed. You know, how often do we sing out of a songbook? And yet we still worship the same God. A lot of things have changed, but one thing that hasn't changed is we still teach from the same Bible, and we're not scared to say that we teach from that same Bible, right? And even though some things have changed, we still don't want to hesitate to appreciate some of those things in the, in the past. In July of 1969, Armstrong and a crew of uh, were headed to the moon, and he had in his pocket, he had a really interesting thing in his pocket. I thought it really strange. I only learned about this this past week, actually. In his pocket, Armstrong had a piece of fabric and little pieces of the fabric that were on the propeller and on the wing of that very first flight that the Wrights took when their plane took off, how, this was the first power flight, took off into the air for 12 seconds and flew 120 feet. Why would, why would he do this? Why would he carry this, this useless piece of fabric? Now they can fly to the moon in this amazing space capsule or whatever they call it, Back in 1969, why would you carry from 1903, why would you carry this little piece of fabric? What's the point? It was his way of saying thank you to the Wright brothers for paving the way for him to be able to go to the moon. He didn't hesitate to appreciate the very short and extremely primitive first flight. Had there not been that first flight, he may very well have never stepped on the moon. Had there never been that first flight. Had you not followed your vision and your passion to follow, not to start a church, that wasn't the vision, that wasn't the passion. And I'll read about that in a little bit. I'll read about that some of that, what, what, what was on the hearts that we heard a little bit through that poem. But had you not taken that first step, what, what was that song that you said that you sang, for trust and obey? We have an anchor. We have an anchor, right? Then it was the wrong thought that I just had. <laughs> Some of trust and obey came into my mind. But had you not had that vision to take that first step forward, where would we be today? Hebrews 13, verse 7 says this, and this is in the Amplified Version. It's interesting that poem had noted some of the challenges along the way. Uh, some people, in fact, left the church due to translations. 
But the reason I'm reading from the Amplified because I think it, it articulates, it speaks very loud to some of the things that really highlights some of the aspects of this verse and it says this, Remember your leaders and superiors in authority, for it was they who brought to you the word of God. Observe attentively, consider their manner of living, the outcome of their well-spent lives, and imitate their faith, imitate their conviction that God exists and He is the creator and He is the ruler of all things. He is the provider and the, best and the bestower of eternal salvation through Christ. And they're leaning of the entire human personality on God in absolute trust and confidence in His power, wisdom, and goodness. Don't hesitate to appreciate those core values. I see in that verse core values of this church. And so I say thank you because it was you who brought the Word of God. You observed it in your hearts, in your lives. You studied it. You desired to know the truth. And then you lived it out. Does that mean you're perfect? Does that mean you never had uh, things go wrong or, or do things, you know, even sin in, in, in light of all of this? No. But even as we look at your lives, and it says that imitate their faith, we saw in, 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 as that you took that step forward, there was this incredible step, incredible leap of faith as you trusted in God. Let me read a little bit about, you know, it's just, this is, so we say thank you. I say thank you personally for doing that, for, for persevering, for imitating that in your life. We see it here today. You know, you're still involved in, in reaching people's lives in totally different ways than in the beginning. But you still have an impact on our lives. I don't know how many years you've been teaching. But thank you for your diligent service in teaching. It's amazing. Don't hesitate to appreciate and imitate. In a quote from that Gore Teacher Midnight Conference book, uh, 1874 to 1990, talks a little bit, some, some really interesting phrases. And I'll quote them. Because this is the heart of where this church was born from. We were families with growing children and realized the spiritual need for us and our children. That says it, right? That says what was going on in the hearts. We realized that. In this group, we sensed the Lord opening the way. Here, I, I love this part of it too because it talks about... This is that faith that I mentioned earlier. We could not see the future, but we fully trusted in Him to lead us day by day. Don't hesitate to appreciate and imitate that. And I'm talking to us, we're talking to two different groups here. We're, we're thanking you for 45 years of, the, of ministry and in between. And now I'm saying this to our current leadership. Let's the, don't hesitate to appreciate and imitate our, our founding fathers of this church. Remember the strong desire they had to know the word of God. To feel their, to feel their spiritual hunger that was inside of them. Don't hesitate to appreciate. You had a vision to, to see truth taught to all age groups. Only two months after that first building, that first initial building was, uh, was officially opened, two months after that, uh, organized Sunday school began. Because there was a desire to teach the young children. And Mr. Newfield, you might be able to answer this. I'm not sure when it was that young people started, as it was called back then, but it was very early in the life of the church. Do you remember? Well, just about as soon as we were in that building, we started young people. Wow. Because I, I texted my brother the other night and just asked him, did you attend youth 
at, at home. See, he said, yeah, Marion and I, his, his uh, girlfriend at that time, wife now, had attended here. And so it, like early on, these were, these were things that were important to the life, to teach the different age groups. There was vision, there was planning that was going on. Thank you because you have left a rich legacy and it's brought us to where we are here today. We want to thank you for the godly legacy that you have left behind. I want to thank you for the many sacrifices that you have made. Whether it's through time, resources, energy, sacrifices for family time. You, you know what? If I ever knew you very recently as I was talking with one of our founding members, you know, we took loans out to start the church. We had a house payment, and, a, and yet we borrowed money on the church. What a sacrifice. Ultimately, we want to give thanks to God our Father, because without Him we would not be here. Without Him, He would not have gifted you. Without Him, He would... <coughs> without Him, we wouldn't be here today either. He was the one that gave you that vision, and you led by the, the, the indwelling Holy Spirit. And so, we thank you. I, I thank you from the bottom. I, it's such a... It seems like such a word that falls so short today when I thank you for that. But if you could make that somehow big in your life, then that's what it would be, me saying thank you for what you have done. I want to read one more quote from the Gorgias Dominican Conference book. Before I do that, oh, where did I do that? I, I have so many precious memories of, no, I'll, I'll share this later. I want to read one more quote from that Court Teacher in Midnight Conference, 1874 to 1990. And it's getting closer to the end of the article. Many, many souls have entered the doors of this church building, and many have found help. And then it goes on to say, All praise and honor and glory belongs to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And I say, Amen. And then closing that little comment, it said, said this, Luke 10, verse 2, reminds us, the harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he send forth laborers into the harvest. There's a lot of leaders here. There's a lot of people that have spoken and had a huge part. All of us, in fact, that are here have had a huge part in this church being where it is today. And we give God the praise and the glory. Because when you think about it, when you look around this room, we say, we say, uh, you know, the laborers are few. And I say, we have a good bunch of laborers. Thank you, God, that you gave us a good bunch of laborers. Don't hesitate to appreciate. And as we begin to look ahead, to this year and this and the year beyond. If we were to appreciate and imitate our founding members, how many more souls will enter the door here at OMC and find that help that they're talking about early on, right? What would happen if we fully trusted Him to lead us day by day? What will the next OMC expansion look like? Where might God take us next? Do you get, I, I'm, I'm literally getting goosebumps as I say those words. Where is God going to take us next? Well, aren't you satisfied we have this? Yes, I, God has given us an amazing building. I'm not talking about the building. I'm talking about how many more souls can walk in the door that we can, we can share Jesus Christ with them. How many more souls can we reach out into our communities and share Jesus Christ with them? If we, if we continue to appreciate and imitate what our founding members did, 
Where will it be? I remember, I remember very clearly uh, the opening of this building right here. The first services we had. In fact, the first time this was ever used, there was a window right there where that where that door to the kitchen is, and, and there was a window right there, and we we're having revival meetings. Yes, Pastor John, it was a revival meeting, and we were looking, people were overflow seating was in here because the church was packed. I remember that. It's a fond memory of, of the church growing. I remember the day when that, I was gone for uh, four years in between, and all of a sudden that church came to, uh, came to be, and I remember very distinctly standing in that far aisle with John Newfold. Remember, one of our, our dear, dear John Newfold, what a uh, dear deacon, instrumental in fact, in, in the addition. What a, what a huge man we are thankful, John. And I remember standing with John. And because I was so excited that the church leaders had come up with this vision that we want to see more people hear the good news of Jesus Christ, so we needed to make more room. And John Newfield and I were standing in that far corner. I don't know if John remembers it or not, but we talked a little bit, and there was tears in my eyes. And, and my thought was, my thought was, man, what is God going to do? I'm excited to see what God is going to do. And I had no idea it was going to be that I would be part of the leadership in this way. What is God going to do? Man, that's, it gives me goosebumps because there was faith. And let's go back to, what's that one comment? Oh, where did that go? But it gives me goosebumps. I can't find it just now. I'm not going to take time. But as, as, we, as we think about going forward, it gives me goosebumps. But you know what? We're going to take it step by step. We, we don't know the future. We don't see the future. But we know this, that God is faithful. And he will continue to lead us. He will continue to, to direct us and guide us. And so with that, we continue to move forward. Because we have a desire to see people know Jesus. To fellowship together. To care together. Man, it's just one of the things that I appreciate so much is as I was coming here and, and thinking and looking at the parents, some of the parents coming in, and we have a good example right here. Our founding members played a huge role as, as founders, became a deacon, a teacher, a leader in the church for how many years? And now your daughter and son-in-law are part of our leadership team as a deacon couple. Like, what is that? Man, this is we. Uh, Henry Newfolds. You know, you see your, your, your children part of leadership, and uh, man, God is good. God is faithful, isn't he? 45 years of growing, and God is still good. Does that mean some of the, you face struggles and challenges early on? And those struggles and challenges still, you know, they, they still have, happen in, in the leadership. But God is so good, and he is faithful, and we'll continue for the next 45 years or however many years God gives us to make sure that we stay true to his word and, to, and that, that same vision that things will change it will be different tomorrow but there's one thing that stands true and that's God's word thank you so much Pastor Gary, um, as I gave you heads up before, this is a time for open items, so if you have a word of encouragement or something that you'd like to share, then um, maybe uh, keep it positive and keep it short, but uh, you are very welcome to come on up, and uh, open items is often uh, a very special highlight, so if anybody would like to share, maybe they have a special memory or something that they'd like to share, uh, come on forward, this is time for open items. And if nobody comes forward, I have a bunch of bad jokes, so you better come. <laughs> well, I was asked to share some of the steps that 
we went through to get this uh, church started. But before that, as I've sat here and listened, I somehow have a feeling you need to know what God did in my life to get me to, to the point where I was willing to follow Him. And that had a big impact in, in our church. I grew up at Aberdeen, north of Aberdeen, and I went to the Berkeley Church. Uh, ben Fast, Reverend Ben Fast, he was my school teacher. He taught us well. Um, always appreciated him a lot. And uh, so he opened the door for having Sunday school in, in school, um, half an hour every evening or after school for a number of years. So that really helped me. I went to Sunday school every Sunday, church every Sunday with my parents. And uh, in my school years, Alfred Friesen came around and he had this program to memorize verses. And I joined that program. And in that little testament that I got from him, I have it written down there that in November, when I was 15 years old, that I received Jesus as my Savior. And I had put that away and never really uh, looked for it, but here a couple of years ago, we went through some boxes and I found that testament, and I was so thankful for that. Then, in the following years, in my youth years, at the Word Taller Church in Aberdeen, or North of Aberdeen, we had Bible studies with Bishop Abram Buder and Pastor Henry Dick. We had that for three years, three winters. And so there was about 40, 50 young people that went to this Bible study and, and we did a lot of singing. And those two gentlemen, they had a passion for to just teach us and to train us to live the spiritual life. And as I moved away from Aberdeen, for a number of years, uh, I kind of had put that all in the back burner. But uh, in 1968, my aunt and her husband moved into Ozer, and she was dying. And then my dad wanted me to go and see her, it was dad's oldest sister. And so one night we did. And as we visited with her, which was only about 10 minutes, I went to take her hand and said goodbye to her and very quickly moved away. And she all at once tightened her hand on mine and pulled me back and she said, I need to talk to you. And I was as scared as a little rabbit. I, I just did not feel good about this. And then she told me that what I have been asked to do, that I should do it. I should teach my children how to pray because someday I would really need it. And she said, God has a ministry for you. Don't ever say no to him. And we went from there and I said, no, that, that isn't really what, what I want. And there was a spiritual battle that started in my life that was really raging. And <coughs> the beginning of September in 68, we moved to my dad and mom's old abandoned farm for two and a half months. Uh, it wasn't good because we didn't have water, we didn't have power, we, we had to use wood to eat. And, and uh, I was working <coughs> from around 5 o'clock in the morning till something like 8 at night. And my wife was there with three children. The youngest was only two weeks. Brian was only two weeks old. And my wife did not do good. Absolutely not good. And uh, so God took us through a process that was uh, good for us, and yet we didn't think so. We didn't feel very good about it. November the 17th of 1968, we moved into Ozer, and we didn't know why in the world would God bring us to Ozer. And uh, 
It was only a couple of months later, God worked it through in our hearts, and Marge and me both knelt down in our bedroom, and we absolutely, totally surrendered our lives to God. And we said, what you have for us, we want. It was shortly after that, that John and Mary Weed, and Marge and myself with our families, started getting together in homes, and we had fellowship, we did a lot of singing, and we prayed, and we discussed scripture, not Bible studies, but scripture, we discussed scripture, and that little group kept growing. It didn't take long, then David Ferris started coming, uh, Nettie and, and Sarah Fair came, we met with their mom and dad, their mom and dad, uh, Ron Newfield's mom and dad came, and so there was probably about five, seven couples uh, that got together on a fairly regular basis to uh, have fellowship. We just needed it. One of the last times we were together was at Jake and Ann Weaves in a two-car garage and it was about full. And uh, so that's kind of my, my background what God has done in my life, and it wasn't what I was doing, but everything but what God was doing. And as I was asked to share, I want to share some of the things that I wrote down from meeting to meeting, to so that you can see the timing that God had for us. I want to try and ask, uh, answer some questions. I've been asked, why was there? I have been asked, what created the readiness to birth a church? I have been asked, why was it so important that God move quite speedily with us as a group? And on what were we to gain by doing this? November the 2nd. We got together November the 2nd at John and Mary Weaves for the simple reason to have fellowship. John and Mary and us loved it. <coughs> Even Betty Harder, Mary's and Mark's cousin, they were here from Alberta. And so we just got together to have fellowship. And we enjoyed the evening. It was just a normal evening. It was fun and we enjoyed it. Mid-evening. Jake and Ann Weave came to John and Mary Weave and told us that Jake had been told by the bishop of the Old Colony Church that he would not need to preach. <coughs> and so we talked about it. It, it, it got late that night. And what I remember, as we, we prayed and, and talked about it, I asked if we could have a church in a house somewhere, which at that time did not happen. Uh, Jake just felt that, you know, we needed to get things resolved with the old colony church. The following Sunday morning was, was communion, and so we didn't want to go there that way. And so it was kind of left that way. Sunday morning, early Sunday morning, John Weed phoned Jake and they talked and they decided that we would have church at Jake and Ann Weed's. It was not decided Saturday night. So John called us and we made some calls and in a very short time, when we gathered at Jake and Ann Weed's, we had 11 families represented there. Pastor Wade Jake's text with that morning was Luke 16, 16. It says the law and the prophets were proclaimed unto John. Since then the gospel of the kingdom of God is preached and everyone is forcing their way into it. That's the, the text Jake had that morning. Our closing song was, Will Your Anchor Hold? <clears throat> After the service, I remember very clearly 
that I asked, where can we get together next Sunday? And uh, as we, we talked about it, we came to the conclusion we need to try and resolve this with the old colony church. And I'm glad we did. With respect to, to Pastor Jake, but Marge and me had decided Saturday night already, after we got home late, that we would either go to the Great Mennonite Church the following Sunday for church, or we'd go to Saskatoon, because we were finished at the Old Colony Church. And some of the reasons were I was a song leader, and I had issues with the bishop of how I was leading song. When I, when I led the song, I liked to kind of go a little fast. The old colony had a very slow pace of singing, and that didn't excite me. I liked to have a lively singing. And so what I did, and uh, a lot of songs in the back of the book, you'll have four or five numbers on top of the song, and uh, if you go to some of the English songs and melodies, if you studied it a bit, soon you'll find that you could use them on the German songbook because they had the same numbers. And so then we would sing lively English hymns on the old German song, uh, songs, which made it a totally different song. And so we enjoyed that. And then I was reprimanded that I shouldn't do that anymore. In that, Pastor Jake Weed and Ann Johnson's dad, Pastor Peter Peters, they called me the one night when I was told that I couldn't sing anymore or shouldn't be using that, that kind of singing. They called me and asked me not to quit. Then I remember that the bishop had said that everybody could do as they wanted to. And so I decided I was back up there Sunday morning and I started the song with Stand Up, Stand Up for Jesus, that melody. And that was something I probably shouldn't have done, but I did. But people loved it. We had people follow from the Anla, came to Martinsville Church just because of the singing. And John Weed was a song leader, and I was a song leader, and we loved it. Anyway, that brought us to the end of that week. And Peter Gunther's volunteer that we could gather at their home on November the 10th. But November the 5th, a group of us people met in the Martinsville Elementary School and we had a meeting to decide what we would do because we wanted to get this result. We appointed three Peter, people and one was Pete Gunther a Jake Weed from Oak Warren and a Jake Clausen from <coughs> Martinsville, they went to, to Bishop uh, Enns and told him that we wanted to get help from Manitoba to come and solve some of the issues that we were going through. And he refused our request. And so, what do you do? We have been totally refused to be able to make things right. November the 4th, I come home from work. I know that the little hall of our school is available for rent. So I quickly went and talked to the counselor of Osberg and asked him if the building was still available. <coughs> and he told me no, it had been rented out. So we need to see God's timing in all of this. So I said, well, would you reconsider if the group that we had just been together, if we wanted to rent that building, if they would give us a chance? And he says, well, let's rent it out to a company in Langham to store furniture in. I said, can you take it to the meeting? Well, he says, tonight is the meeting. So that very night, he took it to the meeting. Tuesday. 5th of November, 
I went to talk to Mr. Lappy right after work again. He said, you can have that building. You can rent it for $100 a month with utilities included. So here I am. Nobody really knows what I'm doing. And I'm renting a building. And uh, I didn't know what, what was going on or why I was doing some of the things I did. But I have always been a very determined kid right from young. Mom always told me that I was very determined. <coughs> I wanted to do things I, I just didn't. I, I just went ahead and did them. Anyway, when we get, got together at Pete Guthers that, that Sunday morning, November the 10th, there was only 11 families, not 13 that had been there the first Sunday morning. So after Pastor Jake spoke on Exodus 21, verses 2 to, to 6 that morning, and after the service, I told the group what I had done during the week. And some were kind of taken back. Others said, well, maybe we should consider it. And so I offered that if they came down Monday night, we could go and look at the building. And if we wanted to rent it, then we could. And if not, that, that was fine. But there was 19 families that were represented at our house that night. We had the meeting, Pastor Jake opened with prayer and, and a word, uh, some scripture. And during the meeting, Corny Gunther said that the Hepburn Gospel Church had said that they had some views and some songbooks and we could buy them if we wanted to. We went and had a look at the, the hall and came back and decided that we would rent that building. So you need money for all of that. So we had a collection. We raised $236 that night in that collection, which paid the hall for a month, which paid the pews, and we had some money to go buy paint. And so that week became very, very busy, and especially Saturday. <coughs> We had so much to do. November the 17th, 74, we had our first church service in that little building. There was a couple from Prostitute. There was two couples that nobody seemed to know. I was sometimes said, well, maybe we entertained angels unawares because nobody seemed to really know who they were. And we had 25 to 26 couples, families that were represented there that morning. So that little town hall, as some called it, some still called it the old school, had now become a place of worship. Pastor Jake spoke that morning on Hebrews 12, 18 through 29. And it was just an awesome service. I, I remember it so well. Monday, November the 18th, we had a meeting in that little hall. And we decided that we needed structure to be able to continue because we were totally independent. So I think at that meeting, Peter Gunther became our recording secretary. John Reeve and myself became leaders, the song leaders. John Lepke and me became the people that looked after the money. I think we put some ushers in place. We also decided that we wanted to have Baba study on Wednesday night. I don't know what all we decided that. that morning. But after everything was said and done, from the night around 5 o'clock, 1968, November the 17th, when March of May moved into Ozer, November the 17th, 
1974 was the first service that we had in that little. It was exactly six years from the time we moved into Ozer <coughs> that God had started the church. And I sometimes ask myself, why did God bring us to Ozer? <coughs> and I think it was to prepare us for something special. Because we got to know people in Ozer that didn't like it that we were doing what we were doing. And yet, they were the people that helped us to rent that little hall. Can you see, see how God works things that everything from meeting to meeting, now I'm going to try and answer some of the things. October the 6th, at 12, 1975, 13 couples, it was on a Saturday night, 13 couples joined the, the CMC. Sunday morning, another couple joined the CMC. And so there was 14 couples in total. But why was there? That's what I want to try and answer. I don't think that we as a group had ever talked about why it should be Osner. But I think God had decided it would be Osner because he moved Reverend Pauls to the name of the land. He moved the Osner Council that we rented this building in Osner. The building was on the far side of town. And, uh, but Marge and me lived in a little hut just across the schoolyard here. Old elevator office, uh, renovated into a home. That's where we live. And so, you know, it was also special for us that God brought us to Ozer for a very special reason. The other thing is, why was the readiness to birth the church? Presbyterian had had a similar experience in 1973. If you remember, in 1974, in the middle of April, they had a group of people go to Manitoba to check out the CMC conference. It was a time when our Department of Highways were, were on strike, and Larry Peters desperately wanted to be born that night. <coughs> uh, the roads were closed. We had to wait until about 2 o'clock to get a big Peter's voice to get the roads closed. The group from Manitoba was uh, from Prescott who were stranded on the highway in Manitoba because all the roads were closed. Uh, what that happened in, in the, the April of 74. And so with seeing what happened there, we just felt that we could go ahead and do something similar. And then the way God prepared people to be ready to do the different things to make this happen. It's just absolutely amazing. And why does God move so fast with us? I still believe that if he, God wouldn't have moved, and even if we wouldn't have had that church service on November the 3rd, the people would have just gone to different churches, and a church plant would have never happened. But God knew what he wanted. And so he directed it that we went fast. Every step was special timing from God to make this happen. I have never heard before that a church plant could be done in three weeks. Ozer Mission Chapel, that church plant was done in three weeks. Though many things happened before and after, but it was all God's timing to make it happen. And so, I have always been very blessed to be a member of Ozer Mission Chapel and the ministries that God has given me to do, and probably youth was one of the best ministries <coughs> I've ever been in. They, they were special, and God just used me in, in that ministry in a way that I had never thought possible. And I just want to give a heads up to our youth. You, the, our youth are so special. If you have an opportunity to minister to them and share God with them, 
That is, I think, there's nothing, nothing more special than that. Now they want to carry on, he says. 
but it was Reverend Paul's. He had said, the Lord told me to come and see you. I didn't know why. But he says, I can't tell you what to do, but I can show you to the one who can. Reverend Paul's was such a big inspiration to Jake. He said, I don't want to be a nuisance to Reverend Paul's, but he was always there for him, and they had great discussions. In the, in the old colony church, while Jake attended all these harsh meetings, there was two pastors that said, if you leave, we're leaving too. But when persecution came, they couldn't take it. They didn't be with him. So in the Old County Church, we had, when communion came, we had one Sunday a preparation message, then the communion, and then the Thanksgiving. Well, Jake hadn't been at the communion service, so he was told then. He had prepared a message other than Thanksgiving, but he was told that his place was filled. And when I think of that, I just think of uh, uh, John 9, 35, where the blind man was made to see. And uh, all the persecution that came to him and his parents. And uh, the parents said, well, we'll ask the son. And the son <coughs> said, well, do you want to be believers too? But then they put him out of the church. And it says, and Jesus found him. Well, Jesus found Jake many times, too, when he was going through all these struggles. I remember Will forget her saying one time, if God allows trials, he wants to grow us up. David Jeremiah said, patience is not the ability to wait, but how we act while we wait. So that Sunday, which would have been the Thanksgiving message in the Okoli Church, we had our, uh, as was mentioned, our gathering at Jake and Ann Weeps. And they gave us the song that we had sung. How many of you remember what Bible verse we chose as our own? Does anybody remember? We had a certain Bible verse that we chose. 2 Timothy 7 makes 14. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. I want to make sure I say it right. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. So that was to be our special verse. And uh, John 15, 11 talks about joy, the joy of the Lord. So joy is a choice. When we rise up in the morning, do we say, well, there's a 20% chance of rain and cloud? Or do we say, there's 80% chance of sunshine and clear? Do we start the day with the joy of the Lord? Or do we just kind of hum do and make do with the uh, they're flick of my people. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a few things in this recipe book. You may not all have that, but where it talks about the history of the church, I had a few things that I wanted to add. Uh, as Henry mentioned, we had a first offering to pay the rent of the church. And then we had our Bible studies. We also had our family night once a month. A lot of sharing. And we had 12 couples who were going to uh, join the church. Bishop Schoenberg came and he spoke to each one of us. Then he went and talked to the old colony church. Have these people ever caused any problem in the church? No, they said they really haven't. Well, can you tell me how are you a Christian? And the bishop said, I cannot tell you that. I cannot say that. He says, that's all I needed to hear. So he said, these couples want to leave the church. You can take their names out of your church book. 
it will be attending concert. Reverend calls, as was mentioned, he donated the land for this church. We are ever grateful for that. It would have cost us so much to buy all this land. And when we were going to start building the church, we needed money, so we were asked, could we give pledges as to what we might be able to give so we could build the church? And then came the name as to what we're going to name the church. And the discussion was Mennonite <coughs> Church and Mennonite whatever. And uh, Jake said, we don't want it to be just for Mennonites. We want this church to be for whatever denomination comes. So, and we want to be mission-minded, so it was decided that it would be also a mission chapel. And that we would keep it that way and try to have missions on our minds. And I think that we have done that over these years, and I'm very happy to see we've had a lot of missionaries go out, and the joy of the Lord has been so great. And we've experienced that from day one when we left him. It's just the blessings that have been ours. And we don't show it on our faces many times. I think we need to often remind each other, have you got the joy of the Lord? Are you showing it? If, we're, if we say we have, let's show it with our faces. 80% chance of sunshine, maybe 100%.
There was revival like a call, an altar call. What's an altar call? I've never heard of such a thing. Um, there was people streaming down from the balcony, and they were coming down the aisles. Oh, I thought, this is supposed to be a church. We're supposed to be quiet in the church. You can't believe this. Very, very uncomfortable. But when there's guys met in the front, and the front of the altar, so okay, you know, that's supposed to be the altar. <laughs> Here's the altar call, and I had no idea what an altar call was. One was coming down the up from the balcony from there, the other one from here, and they were two young men. And they embraced each other and they cried. And I thought, man, I'm supposed to cry. This is this has got to be the top. You know, the men crying in church in front of everybody else, this is it. But then God spoke. The terrors, they would shift one in front of the other. They would talk, they were identical twins, Italian twins. And uh, he said, okay, I want you to tell the people what happened. Here were two brothers. For eight years, they hadn't talked to each other because of, because of a family feud. Then I thought, now they were embracing and making, making it up. Then my mind went to work. Who would have quit this? Why, why would they have come together? And, that has to be either God or Satan. Who started the fire? Well, it wasn't God. It wouldn't have been God to start the fire, to not for them not talking to each other. Then uh, they were making up and racing each other and forgiving each other. I tell you, when I went home, God took a hold of me. And I took a desk Bible. I spirit reading. And I don't ever want to forget that. But I want to say why, why I'm here today, what the power of prayer can do. You have no idea. Somebody must have prayed for me. I, 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 will, I don't know who. Because I didn't come from a church family. I didn't come from a close family either. But somebody must have prayed. And very likely, I'm thinking, from the people from Revival Fellowship. So when I see a person coming into this church, I kind of think there's a soul that needs somebody. Somebody will sit beside that person. Sit beside them. Don't let them just sit by themselves. They are here for a reason. <coughs> Never underestimate the power of prayer. So all I have to do, God bless you. Speaker, and I'm not a writer. I know, and like the West said, to get baptized, I had to take the written calendar, the written test of baptism, and I was to read it over and over again before I was spirit. That when I kept it in work, so I had to do it over and over again. And then so that's when I I turned my head to the Lord. And when I started building this place here, I went to the place at the time. There was some of the stuff I was able to get from the company. They had lumber, two sixes, two washroom plates, and all that stuff. Like, uh, all the truckle and trustles down, down here to use to build the church. So, I went down the two and six and a half to make sure that we did it for the inside of the cement to put insulation on it. That was, that was in many things I said at the beginning of the church times and I was, I was the head janitor sort of for all those years as all I remember. And I took care of it whenever I could and, and then needed to do Thank you.
was just going to mention that a great uh, part of why we had such a group to press forward was we were all young couples with young families and we had a group for our families. So that was all I was going to mention. <laughs> Switch the last song. You okay with that? You find that your songbook's uh, number 265. We have an anchor. By doing that, I'm going to briefly share my history in Moser Mission Chapel. I was working at Valley Lumber at Hague when the uh, footprint of this church building, that church building, 40 by 70, when the hole were dug in the ground. And uh, I'd never get lumber here. I was not a believer. I didn't know all the history of it. But I delivered lumber here. And in the course of time, uh, when I was searching, my twin brother, like I said, I don't know who was praying for me. Well, I know who was praying for me. My twin brother, Bill. He was in another college. They had prayer meeting every day before, after class and before supper. <coughs> Said he need you to pray for my brother John. She was in the Lord. And it was, I don't know how long, probably close to a year, to the point where in the fall of 1976, in that first original church building, we had revival meetings. And the song, Just As I Am, which was so popular, a song that was played for the altar call. And I was standing there, we were standing to sing it, and I was just nervous. I was just so nervous. I was just so nervous. I knew I needed to go. I knew I needed to go. I knew now already what it meant to be saved. And so I finally I went forward. and. Uh, I think it was Tina's dad that prayed with me, if I remember correctly. And he led me to faith and knowledge and understanding of what Jesus did for me on the cross and the assurance of salvation. And in the course of time, together with introducing to the youth leaders, I was a song leader. When this church, this edition was being built, uh, I was so many other volunteers. I remember Henry was probably the uh, engineer the whole thing uh, this, the arch is going up the beams going across the, the crane that was here to put those things in place and then to start working with wood oh I was in my day I love working with wood so here I could go anytime I wanted to for the most part there was always volunteers here and I could work with the wood I bought a new skill saw at Sears and ripped about six two by eights and it burned out. <laughs> That's a different story. But God has given me opportunity to serve, and especially with scene. And you know that uh, Margaret said it first. Aren't you people happy? Isn't there joy in life? Oh, I felt that so many times. Is that, do I need to dance up here to make somebody smile? I care you would join me. <laughs> right? <Yeah>. No? <laughs> Pat said no. <laughs> but anyway, God has taken me through some very personally difficult times. He has brought me flat on my face a number of times. But it was for my personal growth, for my coming to the point where I would see before God, I am nothing. 
I am only what he can make me to be. And so after those times, coming through those times, God just filled my life with joy. And that's why I love singing. I love singing. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's got to be one song every Sunday that the praise and worship team has that gets them step going. At least one. If we can ask for more hymns, I can ask for at least one. <laughs> That's right. You agree? Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? <laughs> you have to have a show of hands, right? But it's not not as yet. Number 265. Let's sing together. And I'm just I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say one more thing about some of our leadership. I remember in those early years, I was struggling with sin, struggling with temptation, and so many things that we had. Revival meetings after, and I think that was uh, with Henry, no, not with Henry Hunter, there was another one. But anyway, I went to the front for counseling, and I uh, sat with Jake Weave, or Jake Fair, and I shared my struggles, and I, accept, I expected nothing but condemnation from him. I expected condemnation from him because I was a believer. I should not be fighting and struggling with these things so much. And he, he said, John, I struggle with those same things. What a relief that I wasn't alone. And some of the messages, I remember one that Pastor Corny Gunther had, so powerful in my life at that time, except a corn <coughs> deep fall to the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. And so many things that, are, that have been such a blessing to my life, even leading and singing. And I could tell Sunday mornings, all right, today is going to be a great day of singing. And sometimes not so great. <laughs> but we have here, we have an anchor, such a powerful song. And what our foundation is built on, we have an anchor. Okay.
to give life to all who believe. And to that day, we glorify you, we praise you, we give you thanks, and we exalt the name of Jesus, our Savior forever and ever, till the day you come, Lord Jesus, or till the day you take us home. We want to stand ready. We want to stand before you, Father, and to be bowing our knees to you through our Savior Jesus, who made our place sure, the solid rock. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed. You are free to go. Go <laughs> grace and love of the Lord. Pictures, please. The first generation, founding fathers, parents, couples, families, 11 or 13 or as many, and, and, and.